So what I would say this morning is never, ever, ever lose hope. Even when your life is seemingly out of options. It is really good to see everybody this morning. Let me apologize for two things right off the bat. The first one is um, looking at me through sunglasses. So you're either looking at me through sunglasses or you're looking at me with me squinting really, really bad. This was my choice. The other thing is I just remembered, you know, always on a day like this, am I forgetting something? Am I forgetting something? I didn't think I was. Now I'm up here, I'm realizing, you know, in the last few years, I have more forehead than I've had every other point of my life. And uh, it might get a little pink, but it's good to see you. I'm glad you came out. I really am. And so thankful for joining us. Thankful we got just a perfect, perfect day. And uh, it is absolutely beautiful. Thanks to the worship team for coming early. Some of us were here yesterday setting things up so we know we could pull it off. And uh, thank you for all your work um, behind the scenes. And I'm glad that this is one of the few days in the last two months it isn't raining, which is, which is much, much better. So if you can look, you can kind of see, you know, when we're done, how high that water's been in the past week or two. It's down probably about 10 feet now, but it was pretty high. So anyway, we've been in the book of Ezekiel, and I want to continue that today. This was planned literally weeks ago. I mean, months ago, this passage, and it couldn't be more appropriate. I'm in Ezekiel chapter 37. But first, isn't it good to be together? I think we've learned, or hopefully learned, a few things these past three months. First, the church is not confined or even best represented by a building. For the church to be the church, our best expression is our lives when we live and work in our mission field, which is our neighborhood and our place of business and amongst our friends. Um... When Sunday is over, when Sunday morning is over, I hope we don't go home. I hope we go to the whole world. And that's the goal. And secondly, I hope we have learned to love and appreciate not only each other, but all of God's people. I have missed you, all of you, and the body meeting together is important. And I hope we've kind of had that confirmed a little bit. Ezekiel 37, this is probably the most well-known, the most quoted, popular passage in Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord was upon me. Then he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very, very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, O Lord, only you know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, hear the word of the Lord. And this is what the Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come over you and cover you with skin. And I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. The bones came together bone to bone, and I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy and say to it, this is what the Lord says, come from the four winds and breathe into these that are slain, that they might live. So I prophesied as he commanded, the breath entered them as they came to life and stood upon their feet, a vast army. Then he said, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, and we are completely cut off. Therefore, say to them, this is what the Lord says to my people. I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them, and I will bring you back into the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, and I will put my spirit in you, and you will live declares the Lord. Here's a couple things. First thing, we are really dead. All of us. Left our own devices, we slowly die. Left our own devices, we, we turn inward, and that's not good. 
When we pray and pull away and just get quiet, we often see how much dead in us remains. We never, I think, ever reach the point in life when there's none. There's always some. How about those of us who followed Christ for years and we do everything right? Well, I hope we're also, we're always finding out there's always pride, there's always selfishness, there's always anger, bitterness, grudges that still remain in us. We must never ever think that our own goodness lies at the center of everything good in our lives. It is always grace. It is never our own doing. And I think the last couple months, we all feel a little uneven and disconnected. And things kind of smooth over and then some, an issue remains. And I think we've seen social media come alive with intense anger and bitterness and harshness. I wish we could go back and uninvent it. I think we'd be better. I think a little more dead has crept in among us even in these last few months. I know our society is more dead than it was a few months ago. We all isolated and inevitably when we isolate we pull apart. And now we look at each other through masks. And we don't see smiles and we don't see tones and we don't see the little facial expressions behind everything. And fresh from our Twitter exchange, we think the worst right away. And we're a little more on edge than we've been. And so we pull our little corners. And the person we don't like, the politician we don't like, says something, so we automatically we have to fly to the other end. And everyone is guilty. There's no pure souls. This week we look at events in Minnesota and sickened and saddened by all of it. Saw the initial thing, the perpetrators, the evil that was done. And we prayed for everyone, but now the evil seems to be spreading to every corner. And I'm saddened by all of it. And it should show everyone that our culture, left to its own devices, is prone to dying. It's almost as if we have an inward bent, a pull, an inward direction toward those things that has to be conquered. That was true then. The bones in the story are Israel. Israel after generation after generation after generation of pulling away. Remember some of the early chapters of Ezekiel where God literally said, you can pray, but I'm not going to listen. I've given you chance after chance after chance after chance. Our culture is prone to dying as well. The good news is, and after a couple of those sermons, a couple people pulled me aside, and here's what they said. I'm depressed. Is there hope? Is there any hope? You didn't leave us, leave us with much hope. Especially that sermon where God's presence left the temple. See, Ezekiel has been giving bad news to the Jews in Babylon for, for, for months. We forget the setting. Ezekiel's not looking at the Babylonians and telling them, you nasty so-and-sos, God's going to get you. He's looking at the Jews in Babylon and saying, you nasty so-and-sos, God's not coming to your rescue this time. And God's presence left the temple. You've been unfaithful. You've been hardened of heart. And so I'm sure as they sat on the river, having listened to Ezekiel for months or years now, by now they've learned a lesson and they're looking at him and saying, wait a minute, is there really any hope? And this is where this passage fits in. Seeming like at the end of the rope, God is saying, now that it looks like there's no hope, this is where I'm going to step in. And somehow God always steps in when it looks like there's no other way out. This is fitting today. After three months apart, 11 weeks, we are back together. And I hope it's not coming back together just to go through the motions. As we come back together, let's come back together alive and not dead. In our lives, let's pray for new life. Let's pray for new life for our families. Let's pray for new life for church. Let's pray for new life for ourselves. Pray new life for our culture. Someone asked me this week, we were having a conversation, they said, so why do we pray? Do we pray in order that, like, get God to do something? 
Do we pray that, 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 that if we pray enough or pray the right prayer that God will step in? And my answer was, I said, I'm not saying that God will never, ever step in, but that's really probably not why we pray. I pray because as I pray, my spirit becomes a little more tender and I'm aware of what might be possible, what my role might be of God working through his people. It's easy for me to pray, God, you need to help that person who wronged me. You need to get them and I'm going to just watch you work and be happy when you get them. Or someone might pray, God, this is, this is a ruined relationship. I, I, I need something to happen. And God steps in and says, well, if you really mean that, you might have to take the first step. If you really mean that, you're going to have to maybe humble yourself and step in to the situation with a different attitude. I'm happy this morning that when things look the bleakest, there's always hope. A few weeks ago, we heard that churches won't meet together until there's a vaccine. And I was, I was cranky that day. I was cranky. Ask Alex. I was cranky that day. And I was, I was chewing on nails. And now that's different. And we have a little different future to look forward to here in the next few weeks. When things look bleak, there's always hope. And so here's Ezekiel into a valley with nothing but dry bones. Now, what's a dry bone? A dry bone is something that has been sitting there for a long, 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 long time. When I was 16 years old, I went to New Mexico for the first time. I was west of the Mississippi for the first time in my life. I went with a bunch of, 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 of teens, and I was in New Mexico, and I, I kind of fell in love with the landscape at that time, and I was in a gift shop in either Santa Fe or Albuquerque, and I still remember the T-shirt. And I almost bought it, but I was 16, didn't have any money. And it was a T-shirt, and it was two skeletons sitting on lawn chairs. And the one skeleton is looking at the other skeleton, and... The skeleton has a little thought, a, a word balloon, and the one skeleton looking at the other one says, yeah, but it's a dry heat. <laughs> That's what a dry bone is. A dry bone's been sitting there for a long, long time. It's not dead. It's really dead. It's dead and has no hope. It's brittle. It's, it's not much left of it. So it's a way of saying this is not just some... Well, not that any resurrection is easy. This is not an easy bringing back to life. This is a hard bringing back to life. But I'm thankful in Ezekiel 37, in our day and 2,000 years ago, that we serve a God that's in the resurrection business. So what I would say this morning is never, ever, ever lose hope, even when your life is seemingly out of options. When you have no idea what's going to happen around the next corner, but you know it's got to be bad because it's been bad for the last five months or the last two years, never, ever, ever lose hope. Sometimes we find in life we get to a place where our heart might be a little dead. And I don't say that in any condemning way. You thought everything was good, then the business turned around. Maybe you lost a business, you lost a job, you've seen the savings go down and down and down and down, and you've emotioned yourself out, you've worried yourself out, you've cried yourself out, and you get to a point where you just don't know if you can go on. That's not a bad thing, that's just reality. You know what, my relationship has played out. I've been married to that old so-and-so now for so long, he'll never change. She never learns. There's no hope. Maybe there is. Maybe there is. And maybe part of that hope is, is me. I've learned, I think, not as well as I should, I've learned through the years that sometimes when something's bugging me really bad, that I'm as much part of that being bugged as anybody else and maybe if I can just change my attitude get a good night's sleep come at it fresh the next morning things will have changed but I also know that God can bring new life in almost any situation and I'm trying to turn away from the wind so we don't hear the crackle there we go because sometimes it's blowing from different directions oh very good Sorry for this little technical break. Is 
Is that better? That seems a little better. I've never said this from a pulpit before. I'm glad someone had a fuzzy in their pocket. <laughs> you never know when something might come in handy like that. What I'm really thankful for today is that the Spirit brings life. And you'd think we'd learned that, but that's not what we think. We think life is what happens out there. And all the church is there for, all that God is here for is to ruin your fun and throw a damper on everything. No, life is what happens out there. I got to kind of lose life to, to, to get in God's good stead. Or I have to lose life in order to gain eternal life. I got, there, everything, I got to have this drudgery. I got to have this, this, this persistent, gridded frown on my face as I, as, I, as I soldier on through life. Not that there's not places in life when that might not be the case. We think that God imposes rules to keep us from the bad. If we limit ourselves enough and discipline ourselves enough that we might get good enough. I'm all for discipline. Discipline's a good thing. But that's not how God works. This is not the new life that Christ has for us. One of the promises we have in Scripture is that the Spirit lives in us. Not gives us rules. You have forgotten. Remember Ezekiel 10, God's presence left the temple. You have forgotten me, so I'm leaving. And, and the flame was surrounding God's throne. It was God was in the midst of this flame as he, as he left. If you missed the next week's sermon, um, you go in Daniel, you find that similar description in flame, and you go to some other literature that we not, probably aren't familiar with, like First Enoch where again is a, this beautiful view of God's throne that's surrounded by flame. But in First Enoch, it's described as cloven tongues of fire. And why do I mention that? Because in Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit is poured out, it's described as cloven tongues of fire. Why do I say that? Because I think that's the author of Acts' way of saying God's presence left the temple before and now with the Holy Spirit, God's presence is back in the temple. But we are the temple. When I was a... We have a granddaughter now. She was at our house last Sunday and Monday. And we were very happy about that. We hadn't seen her for about 10 or 11 weeks where she could stay at our house. And she's at the stage now at her house. They live on a street that's not busy at all. And she plays in the driveway. And mom and dad, as she walks down the driveway, stop, you're close to the road. Or they walk down to the road with her and go, stop, look both ways, look right, look left. Do you see a car? She says, no. Okay, cross, cross the street. There's a time in life when we need that kind of instruction. I hope I'm past that time of life right now. There's all kinds of things we need. Our house now, we have all those, you know, those little plastic prongs you stick in all the electrical outlets because sometimes there's a two-year-old running around. If there's no two-year-old, I wouldn't have plastic things in the outlets. I learned long ago, the hard way, not to stick a fork in the outlet. I'm still numb in my right arm if the weather's a certain way. It does explain my golf game. Thank you, Steve. It's amazing how often people of faith still live our lives like we were five and six and seven, that we still need someone to give us a rule and tell us what to do and tell us what not to do. We don't, shouldn't need that with the indwelling presence of God's Spirit. So what does the Spirit do in our lives? Sometimes our people think, well, He makes us all excited and happy and wave our hands a lot and do some of the things we see other people do. I don't know about you, but that's just, I, I've never been that person. I remember someone years ago saying, you know, we go to a football game, we jump up and down, we, someone scores a touchdown, we celebrate and we scream and we give each other a high five, and, and we don't do that in church. I think that's terrible that we think more of the football team than we do of God. And I thought there, really? I, I'm... I know I think a whole lot more of my wife than a football team, and every time she enters the room, I don't give her a standing ovation and give her a high five. If she did, she'd say, calm down. <laughs> so 
So what I do on a Saturday when Ohio State scores a touchdown on about six Saturdays and then I don't think about it on the other 359 days, um, that's, that's, that's the model? So what does the Spirit do? The indwelling presence of the Spirit should sharpen our awareness. And the person it should make us more aware of is me. I should become more aware of when my words were short, aware of when I was a little harsh, aware of when I was maybe less than forgiving, aware of where I was a little bitter, aware of when I'm, I need to extend more grace. should make us more aware. should make us more aware of the needs of the people around us. should make, make us aware when someone's upset, when someone needs affirmation, when someone needs grace, when someone needs love, when someone needs a whole host of things. The Spirit should make us tender. Sometimes you go through life, a lot of people get more narrow and more hardened as they go through life. I think the Spirit should make us softer and broader, not the other way. The other thing the Spirit does, I think the Spirit empowers us. Makes us able to be and do and become what we otherwise wouldn't have been able to become. Now, all of us have some hard wiring. I get it. Alex said he's a high-functioning extrovert. I understand what that means. And there's other people that when they see a crowd of people coming toward them, they want to turn and run the other way. Neither one is right. Neither one is good. Neither one is better. It just is. But God also softens hard edges, enables us to use our personality for his purposes. The Spirit also molds, shapes, matures, creates what wasn't always there. There were a host of things, and I know I could go around the parking lot. I haven't said that from the pulpit either. Go around the parking lot. And I could talk to you about a very unpleasant part of life you went through. That year when the money was low, when you lost your job. That year when something happened. The house got hit by a tornado. I could go through a whole host of things. And now you are more sensitive. You are more able to, to, to impact the lives of others because of the hurt and the pain and the thing that you went through. Other people use those same, same things to become harder and less trusting and more bitter. That's what I mean about the Spirit empowering. In short, the Spirit makes life. In the next few weeks, as we start to return to normal, and there'll be a lot of emails this week, so I'm just getting ready because, you know, we're going to make some decisions and when to start. In a couple weeks, we'll be back inside and um, just kind of let we want to keep everybody updated. But as we return, I don't want to return to just go to church. I've got nothing against church. I want to return to a renewed, revitalized life. I want to return to a mission. I want to return to people who are reaching out. Return to people who are ex extending their necks a little bit. And yes, someone will swing an axe at it. I understand that. That happens in life, but we stick it out again. Because the Spirit gives us life. And Ezekiel had that first little hint at it.